Emmeline lives with two mothers and a gremlin. All of these characters are part of a book series aptly titled Emlyn and the Gremlin. The series is the brainchild of author Stephanie Kane, who goes by the pen name Steph F. Kneff. And she joins us now to tell us more about the series and how she hopes it will change people's attitudes. Welcome. Nice Thank to you. meet you. Very Stephanie. Much. Yes. Okay, not Steph. We'll no. call it Stephanie. Okay, here we have the series. What is Emlyn and, uh, and the Gremlin all about? So Emlyn is a little girl who lives with her two moms and her great Dane. And she knows that a gremlin is sneaking into her room at night to play with her toys. But she sneaks right over the head of the dog who's supposed to be guarding the house. He's not doing anything to help her. And her mom say, there are no gremlins. Gremlins don't exist. But one day she overhears them talking and learns the truth. And then she meets gremlin for herself. So that's book one. In the following parts of the series, they strike up an interesting friendship and you know, have a lot of adventures together. OK, what, what's the idea behind these books? So when my wife and I were expecting our daughter, I think we were browsing Amazon, we were browsing chapters, we were looking for any books that included two moms, even two dads, in kind of a natural way. We found a lot of, you know, Mummy, Mama and Me. We found a few that had the message of Mum and Mum are getting married, but none that really just included the alternative family in a subtle way. So I said, Emlyn has to have something to include her in her community. And as an author, I can do something about mm. it. So I decided to approach my publisher. Um, at first, he wasn't sure about me switching from adult books, which I used to write when I had more time. Um, but finally, he kind of saw the message that I was trying to get across. He was concerned about it being subtle. Um, but we came to an agreement. And he's like, go for it. Have a new pen name, but go for it. <laughs> so. so talk to me about that subtlety. What do you mean by that? I think. What I wanted was a genuine storyline. I wanted my daughter to see herself reflected in a story, but not have her parents as the main focus. Because who wants that? I mean, the focus is on her and what she's doing, and this gremlin that's coming into her room, and the adventures that she's having with her dog, and, and normal kid things, you know? The moms are in the background, and that's kind of where they belong in a child's life. That's what I wanted to reflect in the books. Meaning when we see more traditional children's books with more traditional families, they're not about, hey, this is the, the, the differences in how our family's made up. It's no. just a story. They're not message heavy at all. That's the background. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about terminology. What, what, when you discuss your family, what, what term do you, how, how do you refer to your family? First of all, I would normally just refer to us as my family, my wife, my daughter. If we had to kind of label ourselves as different from other families, I might use alternative. I have an alternative family, a two-mom family. I would probably leave it there. Mm. I mean, I hear a lot of other terms used, not necessarily by me, um, but a lot of families will refer to themselves as queer, same-sex families, whatever, whatever works. Yeah. For me, alternative works. Okay. So when we look at alternative families, so you say that we that some focus too much uh, on that relationship rather than, than the child and their, their adventures in this storyline. Story what other sort of pitfalls have you seen? Um, I'm thinking that... What I expected, having grown up in Toronto, having been raised by very liberal-minded people, was that when I had a child with my wife, would not be a big deal. You know, I wouldn't necessarily face a lot of questions from people about how we came to have a family. It was pretty basic to me, you know, sperm and egg. That doesn't change when you have two ladies. Mm. People are confused about it. Um, it's something that I face kind of going out with my daughter and my wife. People that I don't know will ask me about the construct of our family, how we came to have a family. There's two women. How did you have a baby? And I, I kind of have to take a step back. My daughter is not old enough to understand that that's intrusive. But it gives me a little bit of leeway to practice how mm. I'm going to answer that question before she's old enough to get it. Because I think that for me, my job as a parent is to help her negotiate our difference in a graceful way. You know, I want her to watch me answering people's questions tactfully, diplomatically, but moving on. We're not dwelling on it. Okay. Uh, let me get into that because, um, as you see, people, yes, they're intrusive. Sometimes it's just Sometimes. out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still being intrusive, but, but from a good motivation, if I can put it that, sure. that way. And um, what, and you talk about Emlyn, who's how old now? 20 months. She's 20 months. Yeah. Okay. So in your case, she will be introduced to, to her alternative family, if we want to mm -hmm. call it that. Obviously, she already has been in this growing yep, she up. Knows. Yeah, she she's knows. Got mama, she's, got, she's got a mummy. She's good. She's got a mom and a mummy. Great. Yeah. Okay. But what age do you think children sh should be 
introduced, educate about, learn about alternative families? Well, this is an interesting question because from what I understand, the new health curriculum proposes that children learn formally about same-sex relationships in grade three. And I know a lot of parents are hesitant about this, thinking that that's actually too young. When I heard about that, I was kind of laughing to myself, going, you know, like, what are they going to do when their child who's in junior kindergarten comes home and has a friend with two mothers or two fathers? You know, they're, they're not going to say, we won't discuss that family until grade three. Possibly <laughs> not even then. I mean, like, it's ridiculous. So I think... Realistically, it would be nice if we had some sort of natural integration. The terms husband and wife are interchangeable. A child who's four is going to understand what that means. No one sits down and says to them, you know, what happens when people get married is that there's a mommy and a dad. Like, they don't explain those things in terms like that. Mm. So I think it would just be nice if it was a natural progression. Then there's no need for a sit-down conversation about same-sex relationships because it's just part of the community. Right. Okay. Um, so given that you just talked about sort of formal education where this mm -hmm. this may kind of come up in our in our education system mm -hmm. how much success have you had in trying to get your books into libraries and schools i think this will be an ongoing effort i think that people are interested in diversity they're interested in doing the right thing there are steps being taken toward that but there is a gap between what people would like to do and what is being done. So I know that in Ottawa, where I live, there's a program called the Inclusive Safe and Caring Education Program, and that the public school system is mailing out many you know, inclusive books like this to their elementary schools. I would like that to happen with Emlyn and the Gremlin because I think that it will help the teachers who are not sure about having the discussion. It will just help them integrate, you know? So, this book is aimed at kids three to eight in junior kindergarten, in kindergarten, in grade one. They can read this. It can be part of story time. And it's not a gay specific book. It's not a book specifically for kids with two moms. It's a book everyone can enjoy. And I think that that really is going to break some barriers in terms of that hesitancy when teachers are like, I don't know how to tackle this topic. I don't know what the parents are going to say to me if I bring this up. It's like a big deal and it doesn't need to be. There have been um, children's books before that that are in our schools that, that, that look yes. at same-sex parents um one dad two dads brown dad blue dad yeah um asha's moms belinda's bouquet where parents um some parents and some school boards have, have sought to ban these books that are being taught yeah. have you had any backlash to these yet no but it's been a lifelong goal of mine to have a book banned so if they want to <laughs> why do you say I'm that i'm happy <laughs> Just when I was reading Sylvia Plath, The Bell Jar, I had a big sticker on the front of it and it said banned book. I'm like, really? This is amazing. And I saw a list of some of the most amazing books in literature that have been banned for various reasons. And I think that that just means they were socially progressive. So if I'm socially progressive enough to be banned, I think that's great. There's nothing in the book that would cause it probably to be banned, um, I would hope. But people have a huge fear when it comes to homosexuality. And now we're entering new territory where gays and lesbians are having children and it's no longer about us it's about what's best for our kids so where i might not advocate for myself if people don't accept me and they don't accept my relationship that's okay with me you know i can move on and find other friends i care about my child hmm. because when she goes to school and i meet up with parents who feel that our relationship is objectionable or will treat her differently or she meets a teacher who thinks that this is wrong and that affects her education that matters to me let me push back a bit because you said you know what, what's best for my kid and what's right for my kid yeah. so on the other side of this debate um there are people who says well what's right for my kid is not learning about alternative families that that, that that's for me to bring up with them when i feel that's appropriate so she leads me to the question i mean where do you see the education system's role, its sort of official role, um, when it comes to reflecting sexual diversity in the classroom? I think personally, education is something that parents should be in charge of. I think it's something that should be started at home. So for example, I had a Facebook comment once from a parent who said that they didn't want their child learning body parts at school and then screaming them out in the shopping center. And my reaction was, why would you wait for a teacher in kindergarten or grade one to teach your child the parts of their body so that it would be such a novelty that they would scream them out in a shopping center? Like, is that not your role as a mm. parent to teach them? I don't understand parents who say what's best for my child is not to learn about diversity. 
because diversity is a fact of life. It's not what's in your best interest of your child to keep them in a box where they don't understand the way of the world. I don't think that's in anyone's best interest, but that's my personal opinion. I wouldn't foist it upon someone else. But I think that it's unrealistic to say that diversity is not something that a child should be taught. Are you surprised that we're having this conversation in 2015 or this a little debate? A little. I have to say I am. Hmm. I mean, I, I think that I have to credit my parents because I've never met anyone who has been as determined to understand people where they live coming from their own perspective as my mother. So I think that that was just something that I grew up with, you know, that you have to understand people where they're coming from, get inside their head. Why are they reacting like this? What does this mean to them? And that's helped me kind of navigate this new area where it could be an emotional kind of minefield for me because it's my child. Hmm. So, you you mentioned this off the top. You, you wrote adult books yes, before children's children's books. Yeah. Um, and we could have this uh, a similar conversation about understanding diversity by you writing books about adults for adults. So yes. Why did you want to turn your attention to children's books in particular? I think, first of all, I just wanted Emlyn to have something that reflected her family. I wanted her to have a bedtime story that was about her, something that she could relate to. But the more I think about it, I mean, I could very well write a nonfiction book for parents about you know, how to integrate gays and lesbian families into their, any, any way I could do that. But for me, this is the most non-threatening vehicle I can think of. You know, the parents learn from their children. The children go home with these books and they say, this is just a fun story, mom and dad. And you know, it includes a, a, a little girl with two mothers and this is fine with me. I'm not damaged by this in any way. You know, <laughs> this is one of my favorite books and I really like the illustrations. And the parents breathe a huge sigh of relief. You mean we don't have to have this conversation? Thank God. So, <laughs> um, so, so let's talk about um Underrepresentation. Uh, uh, you know, to what extent does underrepresentation in media um, and literature sort of directly, for you, anyways, so you understand uh, the misunderstanding and hostility towards minority groups I in real life? I feel as though we're definitely taking steps forward. I mean, I'm always super excited to see myself represented in media. I'm just like, oh, The Fosters? That's a great new show. You know, <laughs> we'll watch something that just represents a lesbian family in kind of a natural way. I think it's fantastic. But there are a few and far between. So, I mean, for me, it's always a bit of a a bit of an exciting thing to see something new, you know, because we're like, oh, okay, here we are. We're making steps, we're making progress. But more than that, I, I kind of imagine my grandparents watching shows like that and being like, oh, okay. So I kind of see where they're coming from. You know, they're extremely accepting of our relationship. Our family's extremely accepting of our relationship, but not everybody is. And sometimes a show can be just a gateway. The Fosters, uh, which is uh, on it. ABC Family. Yeah. Um, there's Modern Family, there's yeah. Transparent. The interesting thing about these shows, when they're talked about, the focus is always about the alternative family, always. the success of the show, yeah. the failure of the show <laughs> is because of that. What, is that. what does that say to you? Because here you are writing books that are attempts just to, to normalize. It's like, we don't need to make a big deal about this. Yeah. Lots of people have two moms or two dads or whatever. Let's just not make that the focal point. And yet these shows, at least with how the media yes. um, talks about them, and it, I would argue large, largely society talks about them, is about making that the focal point. It's still the issue. Mm. It's the groundbreaking issue. So in some respects, we're still in that groundbreaking stage, you know, where it is controversial. I'm going to put this on TV and I'm not sure how the public is going to take it. And I'm not sure if this is going to be like a huge career fall for me, you know, in terms of the actors and actresses and whatever. It is still an issue. People are still uncomfortable with it. So we haven't got to that stage yet where it's fully integrated into society. Mm. We're still working on that. Let, let, let me make this parallel. There are um, dozens of examples in popular me media that's portrayed um, racialized families in a positive uh, manner. Black, White, and Just Right, which is a children's book series about being interracial. Um, Jane the Virgin, uh, TV show. Um, and yet one could argue that racism is as entrenched as it ever was. Um, so should we be circumspect in, in terms of looking at the role media and literature play in shaping people's attitudes? I think that positive representation is a good thing. I think that people will always hold certain prejudices just because you know either their families 
kind of led them to that ideal. They haven't had the opportunity to meet other people who are different from themselves. It's not always about race. It's not always about sexuality. People hold prejudices for a variety of reasons, you know, and the media only has a certain responsibility, I think. The rest of the responsibility falls on the person to educate themselves. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I want to get back to something the, uh, this this terminology of alternative families because you said some other other people like you get to describe your family however you want, sure. right? Everyone yeah. gets to make that choice. Um, how sensitive are people when they meet you um, and your wife and your daughter and your dog <laughs> for the first time? Like, what kinds? So you, so you said they sort of say like they look. Some people look at you quizzically or some just people. get right in there intrusively yeah, and say, do that too. Um, so what kinds of questions are they asking you beyond, like they kind of go, what, do they go, I don't get this, I don't understand it, make sense of it for me? Or? Now I've seen everything. Um, yeah, there, there's, it really just depends on the situation. Sometimes it's people that you wouldn't expect. Um, the clue that I normally get is, this is not a rude question, but, so I kind of take a step back, okay, I'm ready. For me, I'm highly communicative. If someone's gonna ask me a question, I'm gonna answer it because I'm just gonna assume they're curious, they don't know, they haven't ever learned about it, they need to be educated, whatever. My wife, not so much. She will you know, tell them flat out that's intrusive. So there's definitely different ways of kind of handling the situation. I don't get upset unless we're directly insulted and that doesn't happen very often. Okay, what do you normally so, say? Wow, I don't think there's a normally. I think it, every situation is very different, but I'm not shy about saying, you know, that is a private question. Um, I would like to turn it around sometimes and say to people, you know, would you ask that question of your straight neighbors? Because essentially what it sometimes comes down to is, how was your child conceived? That's basically the crux of the question. And I think if I asked that to you, how was your child conceived? Would you not think that's somewhat inappropriate would that be a little intrusive? You know, people would turn red. What do you mean, how was my child conceived? How dare you ask me that? Mm. And I'm thinking, in front of my daughter, you've just asked me how I had her. Don't you think she should know before you should know? So what's really interesting to me is that the people who are the closest in my life, my very closest friends, have never asked me. So I would volunteer the information. They know the basics. They've never sat down and said to me, so how exactly did you do this? Whereas some people I meet five minutes later, <laughs> so can you explain to me exactly how two lesbians have a baby? How did you do it? I think those details are my concern. They're my daughter's concern. She's not old enough to understand that. And it's none of your business. Mm. So, uh, well, uh, let me ask about you and your wife, about how much pressure you, do, do you feel any pressure to sort of I don't know, pr 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 present yourselves as a quote unquote normal family. I mean, would, would, uh, the, pe do you feel uncomfortable when people ask you these questions and you're just like, I don't want to deal with this, just go away kind of? Some days, yeah. I mean, some days are like that. I did not grow up in a normal family. My parents are multiply married and divorced. I have step siblings from every direction. So I never felt the pressure to grow up normal yeah. or to present ourselves. It's a bad I don't, word, I don't even know what it is, yeah. actually. Um, in our neighborhood, we've been extraordinarily lucky. Nobody looks at us sideways. But we kind of went through the whole journey together. We moved in when we were just a couple and our neighbors kind of saw us going through the transition, me being pregnant and you know everything that, that entailed and then meeting Emlyn. And so for our immediate community, we are just a regular family. They see how that's unfolded. Um, and in terms of meeting people, I think I, the only pressure I feel is to set a good example for my daughter. So when people ask me questions that are uncomfortable or I think about how to communicate with people, I think, how would I want her to respond when this comes up? Because it's going to come up, mm -hmm. you know? And on her first day of kindergarten, I want her to have an entire arsenal of tools. So that's what I think about. And you lived in Toronto? You now yes. live, you live in a small town, right? I live in kind of a suburb of a suburb of Ottawa. So we live kind of in a rural area. Um, yeah, we live in a subdivision that's part of this country atmosphere. So it's, it's a really interesting milieu, um, but definitely a big step away from urban Toronto. And <laughs> let me ask you about that, because I don't want to, you know, perpetuate too many stereotypes here, yeah. or too many tropes, but do you, do you find it different having your family in a more rural setting than say you would in downtown Toronto? 
At first, I was concerned about that. I'll be honest, when we moved out into a rural community, there is a stereotype of the redneck. I have never encountered one where I live. So sometimes, you know, when you're in an alternative situation, you have to come out to people daily. And when you have a child, you know, you meet their new doctor, you meet their new teacher, you have to come out as different every day. And sometimes you just don't have the energy. Um, and I remember moving to this small town and I had injured myself moving. I think I'd really hurt my back. And I went to see my new doctor who was in the town next. And I remember waiting in the waiting room and I was exhausted and I wasn't feeling well. And I was just like, I don't have the energy to come out to someone else today. I don't know how this person's gonna react to me. I think I just better go home, you know? Because I had in my mind, I'm living in the country. What's a country doctor gonna be like? What are my country neighbors gonna be like? And I just remember her coming into the room to get me. She read my medical file, nothing. Mm. Like, did not care at all. And it's really rare to find that. People are sometimes either like overly cheerful or like masking or you, you can read subtle social cues when you're kind of in that situation, nothing. And that was kind of my first introduction to my new hometown. Mm -hmm. And then I met all my neighbors, all of whom were similarly fantastic. And that's been it. So I feel really lucky in that respect. Let's shift gears just a bit. Um, this summer there will be pride celebrations all over this province, all yeah. over this country. I think a lot of people think of Pride as a big festival, a big adult festival. Yes, that's true. Is there a space for family at Pride? There needs to be now. I think that, you know, traditionally, um, Gay Pride has been a very adult event because gays and lesbians for the past 20, 30 years were not in a position to be able to openly have families. So if there were children in that situation, it might have been because uh, a heterosexual couple split up and then either the, the partner, one of the partners took up with some of the same sex, whatever, and they had another child. But now, you know, lesbian families, gay families are deliberately going out and having children. And so it's a, it's a new family environment. It's something that this generation is sort of just navigating. So definitely, I mean, like I plan to take my daughter to Pride. There's a float, you know, with the dinosaur and the library and whatever. I wonder though, if in future years, there will be kind of a separation between the more adult events and the more child-friendly events, and that would be fine. Mm. Okay, I want to play a little um, bit of tape from you. Okay. This is a show that the agenda did last fall on the state of LGBTQ rights around the world. Um, so this is a, a bit of tape uh, from conservative and gay blogger Fred Litwin, and he's talking about the progress that's been made on LGBTQ rights here in Canada. Take a listen. There's certainly going to be an issue in Canada. We, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of immigrants who come in, a lot of people from countries where the treatment of gays and lesbians is pretty horrible. So some of these attitudes come into the country and some of it is here. But overall, Canada is a pretty good place. And uh, so I'm, you know, it's not, the, I'm not, nobody's claiming it's perfect, but it's pretty good. And I think the focus, I think, of the gay community here should now be on helping our brothers and sisters internationally. They're the ones who need our help. Okay, Stephanie, what do you think about that? Does the fight for LGBTQ rights um, need to focus on more what's happening overseas rather than here at home? I think that's definitely part of our responsibility as a nation who enjoys a lot more privileges and rights than other countries. I don't necessarily agree that the fight is over here. I think that it's just shifted gears in that it's more subtle. There's more of a social stigma that we're kind of looking at changing. There's more of an integration that needs to happen. But for me, you know, World Pride was a huge event because it meant that people who, you know, could literally be killed in their own countries for being gay would have the opportunity to participate in something here, you know, and just to say, this is the hope for your future in your country sometime down the line with help from others, us especially. Hmm. Okay, let's get back to your series of books and just uh, round out our conversation a little bit. What ultimately, um, do you, do you hope will come out of the series books? What's 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 the message? What do you, I mean? What, I don't want to say what's the point, but, but why do all this? I get the individual motivation for your family, so your daughter could be represented. What's the message you want us all to know? I think that what I would really like to see is a future where Emlyn is in school, in high school. She has a ton of friends, like herself or not like herself. Other kids who are coming up below her 
don't even know the difference between an alternative family and a regular family. I would like to see schools taking an active role in trying to normalize and mainstream gay and lesbian families and just realize it's not a big deal. This is what I could do to help. So I'm hoping that schools and libraries will pick up the books, embrace them, let me help the teachers with whatever lesson plans they need in order to not feel like this is such a huge deal and just to let it go. I look forward to the day where we don't have to use these adjectives, alternative families or normal families. Thank you for um, trying to help us all be a little more educated. <laughs> I appreciate talking to you tonight. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.